Hey everybody, welcome to Bod's Mayhem Hour. I'm your host, John the Bod, a.k.a. the Bod Father, with my lovely co-host... Crystal. And as always, we're bringing you guys awesome interviews, and today we have Mr. Eric Eitla, guitarist and vocalist of the band Eitla. They are from Raleigh, North Carolina, and they have a new album out called American Nightmare, and this is their fourth studio album. If I'm if I'm incorrect, Eric can uh, correct me on it here in just a few minutes. But uh, Eric, how's it going? It's going good. Let's jump right into this. What's impressed you the most about making the new album, American Nightmare? What's caught your eye about, if anything? I don't know if I have a good answer for that. <laughs> what what caught my eye the most? I'm going to be a bad interviewer, interviewee, and say I don't have a good answer. Okay, that's a terrible answer. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the I drum. usually have better answers, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> or is there anything that stick um, out to you on the album that you're more impressed with than anything? You know, I think this album turned out better than the other ones. Obviously, you know, you're happy to see a progression in the sound and the production. Probably that, you know, I feel my songwriting, you know, gets better every time as well. And I think everybody, you know, everybody claims that. And I'll do, you know, the, the usual, like, this is the best album yet spiel. Because mm. I feel this is the best album yet. Terrible answer, I know. <laughs> <laughs> what was your experience like co-producing this album with Mike Schaefer from Schaefer's Down Productions? Well, you know, I worked with Mike on the two previous albums, like 2009, Haunt Your Flesh, and the 2011, Effigy. So, you know, basically, I do all the recording besides the drums. So Mike would do the drums in the studio, and then I use my home studio to record everything else. And then I send it over back to Mike to mix and master it. And so, you know, it's kind of a, you know, as him being an outside person and, you know, it's kind of a push and pull to things that I want, right? It's a balance between kind of what he hears as, you know, as someone mixing and mastering sort of as a producer, trying to get a sound and me kind of knowing what I want from my experience and then finding that balance in the middle. So, I mean, it's always been a, a good relationship, you know, working with Mike on the last albums. So I feel like we're on the family feud. Good answer. Number two is good answer. <laughs> uh, I'll get that mediocre answer, but we're getting there. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not warmed up yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord. Here we go. Any songs off the American Nightmare album that stand out more to you than any on it, possibly? I like all the songs, right? I mean, the title track, I think, came out very well. You know, especially when I was writing it, I had wrote the music, and then for a long time, I didn't have any words. And, you know, just out of the blue, it's like it just kind of came together because, I don't know, it was just one of those things I, I was inspired, and right? And then the album sort of... It kind of morphed from that title. I was like, hey, that'd be a good title for an album. Like, I, and I know other people have that album title out there because you know uh, you can't. There's only so many original combinations of words that they'll use in metal. But you know, it kind of came together as the theme of the album, and then like the album art just kind of sprung from there. How much musical growth do you feel like you have gone through since you started doing this? Well, I mean, it's like anything, right? You start out being not so good at it, and I've been doing it a long time, but I think most musicians will come to a point where, you know, you start out, you practice a lot, you, you develop your craft, and, and then you sort of plateau, you know, uh, and, and I think that's with anything, because you, you get good at what you're doing, and unless you're consciously trying to, I don't know, learn a different aspect of, I don't know, maybe I want to take classical guitar and suddenly be a great classical guitarist, but I even forgot the original question, so my train of thought is derailing. But, you know, over the years, I've seen the progression uh, of myself because, you know, I can listen to my old demos and, you know, go, ooh, God, that really sucked. But it was, you know, it's good to look back, and I don't know if a lot of people have done this, but my original demos were on a four-track, and I actually took the time to digitize them uh, when I started getting into digital recording so I could have a record of them so I could kind of go back occasionally, throw them in my recording tool and kind of listen to those original four track analog demos and go, Ooh, those are really stinky. And then kind of listen to the stuff that I, you know, write that's more current and say, wow, you know, that is kind of a good, good progress. Do you do anything differently to keep your mind fresh and open to different things as far as lyrically and, guitars and stuff like that. Do you do anything differently to uh, to block stuff out, maybe? You know, 
I, when I write, I just write to write. I don't really think about anything in particular. You know, something may inspire me. You know, I, I, I like metal a lot as far as the musical genre, but it's not the only thing I listen to. So I just don't focus in or, you know, I, 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 I listen to just, just about everything. And I know everybody will say that, but so I kind of take in all the influences that I can, and, but not, not really trying to be conscious when I write of, of, you know, a certain musical style. And in the past, I've gotten a little bit of shit from people listening to albums and reviews saying, oh, there's too much diversity. Does he want to be a thrash guy? Does he want to be a doom guy? Does he want to be this other metal genre? And, you know, I don't really believe in writing just one type of quote unquote genre. So, you know, when you listen to American Nightmare, you know, American Nightmare sort of may be thrashy, but then you have, you know, more of a ballad and everybody has their ballad, but uh, then there's songs that are sort of more like doom metal or you know, there's a genre that's escaping me, but more Sabbathy style, like with Essence or with um, No Questions. So, you know, I don't limit myself to any one particular metal genre. And I just kind of write to write, like I said, and whatever comes out, comes out. And if, if I wrote it, it can go on an Isla album. Even if it was a country song, I'd put it on an Isla album. Not that I could write a country song, but it would go on one if if I wrote one. How much local support does Isla get via fans and radio play? I tell you, the radio play, zero, because we don't really even have a rock station in Raleigh. There used to be 96.1, and they used to have a local show, but they turned that into like some arbitrary jukebox that plays just about anything that was in the charts. So there's no local radio support. I mean, any scene, it, you know, there's, there's politics with, you know, whose band can play and with dwindling places to play. I mean, there's not that many places in Raleigh anymore, and I'm sure with, you know, where you guys are at, the venues are closing down because, People don't really go out and support live music anymore. So it gets harder to book the shows at the places that do support local metal because of, you know, sort of inside politics with, you know, oh, you're not friends with him or, you know, you're not in that guy's good side. And so, you know, you just keep trying trying to book shows. And, you know, we also play outside of Raleigh and, you know, within, within a few hours, you know, even uh, Virginia is pretty uh, obviously – Virginia is about an hour and a half away, and then South Carolina is about an hour and a half away. So, you know, I try to work the book outside the area as well. But it's getting harder, right? Again, venues keep closing down, and people don't like to go out and support, you know, local metal anymore. That's true. And, and or I, unsigned I, metal. That's true, and I guess it's very frustrating for uh, local bands and stuff like that to to even get their stuff out there, you know, and thank God we've got Bod's Mayhem Hour that supports the shit because we'll play it on here for sure. Well, exactly. And, there, and there, there's a lot of, you know, podcasts that are similar. And, you know, I think it's easier now to get your stuff out, uh, you know, with the way technology works and the cost of recording and getting the quality product out there. But on the flip side, it's so easy to do that everybody and their brother does it. And so then you have, you know, instead of maybe, I don't know, a thousand bands that you're trying to compete with, but you don't have any way to get your music out. Now you have a million bands. And you can get it out easily, but there's so much vying for people's attention. You really, and people have OCD these days as it is, you know, really getting people to pay attention to a band that they never heard of and then following them and getting support from them. That gets harder and harder as well. What can fans expect at a show from Itla? I would say a, a good rock slash metal show. You know, I would say we're pretty energetic, you know, pretty decent stage presence. You know, one thing I don't believe in is over-practicing. So uh, and, and by that, I mean, you know, I've been in bands in the past where we practice twice a week the same set over and over again. And sure, that gets you really good, but then you're so, uh, I don't know, programmed. You know, I believe more in a looser kind of band schedule practice. And so... To me, that makes it feel, it's going to sound corny, but a little more dangerous. I mean, we practice, but we don't over-practice. And so, you know, hey, we, may, we might make a mistake. <laughs> so that kind of keeps it exciting. Might forget some words, but hey, that's all part of, you know, live music and a, a live event. Yeah. You know, I'm not going, we're not a Vegas show where you're going to see Circus Soleil and they have to be perfect. <laughs> and, 
you know, you're going to see a, a rock and roll show. Yeah, and, and if you guys screw up on stage, I mean, how's how many people is really going to catch on to it? You know what I'm saying? I mean, because they're like, well, did he just miss a note there? I mean, unless they really know, you know, track right. by track by track. Exactly. Songs, by heart, by heart, you know, it's like, hmm, did they just screw up? <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I mean, there are some places I think there, there's, there are obvious misses, but, you know, for the most part, you're right. I mean, if somebody misses a, you know, a cue or something, it's not the end of the world right. as long as the man sort of, Unless they look at my face and I make that face like, oh, we, we just uh, we just fucked up. Because I'll make that face and, and laugh and... Everybody going crazy. Yeah. They're like, yeah, we just fucked up. They're still going crazy. Look at them. Or I may announce that we fucked up. You know, if it's really bad, you know, you really never want to stop. But there are occasions like... So we use a backing track. So the drummer plays to a click. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's times when his headphones have fallen out or it came unplugged. <laughs> and if he can't hear the click to get the timing, then you're totally off. And if you're totally off, you can't play with a click in perfect sync with the click. So um, that makes it comical. You, you, you touched on this for a second earlier, but how do you feel about the digital ear that we're in in regards to music, both making music, producing music, getting it out there and purchasing music, finding new music? Well, you know, I talk about the recording piece. I mean, everybody and their brother can do it. There's so many bands out there that have a quality product. I mean, as far as buying music, I mean, I think people forget that, you know, bands spent money and then people feel entitled that, oh, it's on the internet. It must be free. I'm not going to pay for it. And so, you know, and of course, that's why bands are making less and less new music because, you know, people just steal it. But I think on the flip side, places that sell music, like, I think $5 is, if I see it, uh, an album on, for, on Amazon, you know, I'll, for 5 bucks a download, I'll buy it right away if I want it. But if it starts to get eight, nine, ten, fourteen dollars $14, forget it. I don't, I don't need that album that bad. So I think there's, there's that balance of where, you know, people selling music need to look at the realistic value proposition that people will pay for it and say, oh, maybe $5 is kind of that break-even point that we can get more downloads or more people to buy it as opposed i mean it, and when the album came out like the last few albums that come out and, and it's like this for everybody all you do is got to do a search on it you can find 50 russian download sites and get it for free so you know it doesn't take anything to do a, a google search on a band and see that you can get their stuff for free from you know an illegal download site what does itla bring to the table for music in your own opinion I think the one thing that we've gotten the most compliments on is having an original sound. So, you know, I try not to file, uh, follow any trends or try to follow any like, oh, I want to sound like that band. And so I think it reflects in, in the music itself as people saying, wow, that really sounds original. Now, I don't know if people like it is another thing, but, you know, it could be original crap. <laughs> but, you know, sounding original, I think is important. And that's one thing, you know, I'm never going to be famous or I'm never going to get rich off playing music. But I think... That's one of the things I'm most proud of in the way that I write is having people say that having a, we have an original sound. What originally made you want to become a musician? Oh, well, like any, any other teenager, right? Girls. <laughs> <laughs> now, has that been the reality? No, I can't see a correlation, but that was the original thing when I started playing guitar to get in a band. You know, I really wanted to be in a cover band when, when I was 14, so because I had some friends in a small town that were older and they played in a cover band and it's like, Ooh, I want to play in a cover band. But, you know, of course, and when I started learning how to write songs or experimenting with that, I mean, that became more important, you know? So yeah, that was the original thing, right? Females. (laughs) There you go. I told you. (laughs) Any show or moment that stands out to you more than any that you can recall being part of Itla being on stage and a part of. Well, I can think of one funny one off the top of my head. Oh, good. Is uh, so I, I would say this is a proud moment, and it really it didn't not something that we did, but so we were playing a show at a small venue, and for some reason the the bathroom was kind of near where the the area was, and somebody decided to go in and use this facility, and decided that they would let everybody know through a smell of vision that they had used this facility, <laughs> and. We're playing, and you could just, like, everybody's face. I mean, it's the whole little, I mean, it was kind of a small room, too, but the whole place, it just smelled like sewage. Oh, God. And then, ironically enough, 
so we're laughing, right? We're playing a song, we're laughing, because everybody knows, right? It's no secret. And then, ironically, we have a song called Human Waste, which we were playing next. <laughs> but the song Human Waste is not about, you know, that kind of human waste. But it was just kind of an ironic moment to say, you know, oh, it just smells terrible. It's like, oh, we're playing Human Waste next. That's pretty funny. <laughs> Jeez, I'd have, I'd have kicked him out of the bathroom and be like, look, dude, quit. We're, you quit taking the shit. We're, we're playing. Stop. <laughs> well, we don't even know who it was. It was one of those stealthy guys where he went in, like you're not really paying attention to the bathroom, and then it just kind of permeate, permeated slowly. Oh. So it, we, can never see, we never knew who it was. Like he, got, he made a fast getaway, and oh. then it was like a slow <laughs> Made its round slowly around the room. Oh, silent but deadly. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, jeez. Way to go, Chris. You stunk up the whole place. Way to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's totally me. <laughs> See? Eric, I'm, I'm sure you guys get this, but um, what does it mean to you when you guys receive an email from a fan or prior to the shows or after the shows, they come and tell you that your music has pulled them through a bad experience or gave them inspiration to overcome obstacles or it's just made them relax and get away for a couple hours of the everyday bullshit that we go through. If that's happened, what's that mean to you all? Well, you know, it's uh, it's kind of what you do it for, right? Because it isn't about the money. And I don't write music, right? Like I said, to try to get rich, I just write to write. And if people identify it, you know, it's really, I guess you want to say it's really touching. Uh, to sound cliche when people do it. and uh, But there was one guy in particular. And so I used to have, before I was doing the band thing and I was just writing demos, I used to post them. And so years later, and this was like in the early, late 90s, early 2000s. And so then when I started, like, got the live band together, we kind of reincarnated it because there was an original version in the early 90s. I get this email from a guy and he was from Brazil and he just said, oh, you know, I really love your music. You know, I, uh, I discovered it because I, he had some uh, kind of congen congenitive disease and he was going blind and he's like, I really discovered the internet and I came across your music and I really love, it really spoke to me. And so he wrote me this long email about, you know, how it really got him through uh, this period in his life where he was losing his sight. So, I mean, I thought that was kind of cool. And I still talk to him today, you know, you know, when the new music comes out and stuff and, you know, he really loves it. So uh, that's the kind of cool stuff. And, you know, occasionally I'll get that email or even a guy sent me a letter, you know, well, I, I had sent him some merch, like he ordered it. And then he sent me a letter back saying, oh, I love you guys the sound and it's really cool. And I still, I got the letter hanging up on my refrigerator still. That's pretty awesome. Folks, I got to check out American Nightmare, Brainwashed, Essence, and Unsung um, off the new American Nightmare album. Uh, it's pretty good stuff. I like it. I like how they sound for sure. And yeah, there's a lot of diversity to it, but I think that's what makes a good album. And that's, that's my opinion. I appreciate that. So do I. <laughs> Eric, thanks for doing the interview. How can folks stay in touch with you guys, buy some merchandise toward H, things like that. How can you do that? Well, you know, we're on, we're on all the usual outlets, but you know, the main website is just itla.com. That's a I T T A L A.com. Uh, if you Google it, you'll find our Facebook, which is, our, our Facebook, our Instagram, our Twitter is all Itla Music, one word, A-I-T-T-A-L-A-M-U-S-I-C. But again, if you Google it, 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 it just type in Itla, A-I-T-T-A-L-A, it'll come right up and you'll see all the links be the top Google search. Crystal, want to say anything? I just want to say thank you for doing the interview with us. I, I just got to listen to you recently, too, and you guys are awesome. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Hey, man, before I let you go, would you care to do a promo for the show? I can. This is Eric from Itla, and you're listening to Bod's Mayhem Hour. Everybody stick around. we got some great, great music coming up, and you only hear these interviews right here on Bod's Mayhem Hour at Uber City Radio from my lovely co-host. Crystal. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Eric. Thank you.